Hello and a very warm welcome to this ONG podcast. In this podcast, we're going to be looking at amenorrhea. Um, with us today is Kenga again. Welcome back. Hello. And as I said, during this podcast, we're going to be looking at amenorrhea. We're going to be looking at the definitions, causes, history and examination and investigations. And then very, very briefly at the end, we're going to look a little bit at treatment of some of the common conditions. However, this isn't going to be the, the focus of this podcast. So, what is amenorrhea? Okay, so amenorrhea can be divided into two types, primary amenorrhea and secondary amenorrhea. So primary amenorrhea um, has two different definitions. Uh, First of all, it's the failure um, of menses to start by the age of 16. Um, And secondly, it can be the failure of acquisition of secondary sexual characteristics by the age of 14. So that's adrenarchy, telarchy and menarchy. Okay, which we talked about in the menstrual cycle podcast. Yes. Yes. Okay, secondary amenorrhea is the cessation of menses for greater than six months in a premenopausal uh, woman. Okay, and premenopausal is the operative word here because okay. obviously if they're menopausal, you'd expect this. So if they're 65, they're not going to have any periods. No. Um, and it's secondary is a lot more common than primary. Okay. So, talking about common things, let's talk about causes. First of all, how do we divide up causes of amenorrhea? Okay, so the... The causes can be either primary causes or secondary causes, okay? And really, you're going to do this by the age of the patient. So primary causes, I'm not going to actually go into detail about these because, I mean, they're all kind of complicated syndromes and just need to understand that these can be the causes, okay? Okay, okay so Müllerine agenesis, which is a congenital cause, mm-hmm. uh, is the absence of the um, uterus. Yep. Um, and obviously, you're not going to get a period if you don't have your uterus. Obviously. No. Um, additionally, outflow tract obstructions, so imperforate imper- hymens, uh, transverse vaginal septums, so just basically blockage of the actual menses coming out. Mm-hmm. Uh, constitutional delay of puberty, now this is an important one, and it really refers back to the um, definition of a failure of acquisition of secondary sexual characteristics. And it's particularly linked with a syndrome called Kalman syndrome, which you can go, we'll go and look up in your books. Um, and finally, gonadal dysgenesis, and um, this can be also linked with a syndrome called Turner syndrome, which we will discuss in a minute. Yes, we yes. will go into that. But this is not this is not the you know, complete list. But these are the main causes, the main primary causes, yes. and these tend to present younger. Yeah. yeah. Well, you would you would never have established a period. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What about secondary causes? So this is typically in, obviously, older women, um, so um, when I say older, I mean from, say, um, 18 to kind of, you know, 40, and they have had established periods, but then they've not had a period for six months. Um, And most important one, which I'm sure everyone actually forgets, pregnancy. Mm. You're not going to get a period if you're pregnant. That's a favourite one for exams, actually, isn't it? Yeah. There's always one... One person in the one of the questions is always someone with amenorrhea who's actually pregnant. Yeah, um, very simple test which you can tell you if you're pregnant or non-pregnant, and you know one of the most common causes of amenorrhea. Always do a pregnancy test. Yeah. Now the other ones are hypothalamic amenorrhea, um, and that's linked with the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, um, and I'll go into the hormones that we've discussed previously. Hyperprolactinoma. Um, so. Prolactin levels, very important in terms of establishing amenorrhea. Premature ovarian failure, so actually that the ovaries fail, um, aren't releasing the eggs, and obviously you're not going to get um, a period if, mm-hmm. you, if your ovaries fail. Hypothyroidism, also very important, and um, outflow tract obstruction, so fibroids and polyps. Now, if you look at that list, what do you think amenorrhea really should be kind of def- under as I think it's actually really endocrine problems mm, mm. most of these are hormonal problems okay rather than actually being you know structural problems yeah so we can su- we can subclassify it based upon the hormonal sort of state yeah so it's going to be easier when we get the diagram but you get hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism okay all very long words hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism and normogonadotrophic or hypoprolactinemia. Yeah, so here's the diagram. Okay, 
It's a lot easier if I have a diagram. <laughs> right, so hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, mm -hmm. okay, is basically when the hypothalamus fails to secrete GnRH. Yeah. Okay, and then you don't get GnRH going to the anterior pituitary, and you don't get the LH and FSH release. Okay. Yeah. Um, and hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism is when you do get the GnRH being released, you do get the LH and FSH being released, but actually the ovaries um, are failing to release the eggs, mm -hmm. and they're failing, you know, with the kind of um, development of the oocytes and estrogen secretion. So you get premature ovarian failure. Yeah. Okay. Normal gonadotrophic is when all of these things work, but for some other reason you're not establishing menses. So your hormone levels of your LH and your FSH will be normal, and your estradiol levels, which is the main estrogen in uh, premenopausal women, will be normal. Okay. <clears throat> and then hyperprolactinemia uh, is actually when you get an increase in secretion of um, prolactin from the anterior pituitary, um, and you don't get uh, dopamine, there's not enough dopamine to stop the prolactin secretion. Okay. Because okay. remember, dopamine stops prolactin. Yeah. So I always have this diagram in your mind when you're thinking yeah. about these yes. things. Yes. Okay. So what do we do with a lady who presents saying, I haven't had a period for six months? Okay. Please do this logically and think about this logically, okay? Because the problem is in exams you will be presented with a foray of hormonal derangements and you need to just go through them and think, you know, what's the actual underlying cause. Now 90% of the diagnosis is going to be done on the history alone. Yeah, like all of medicine. That's with yeah. anything. Yeah. Um, so just the way I'm going to go through it is it's going to seem odd. But you need to box everything, all the kind of symptoms into categories, otherwise mm -hmm. you won't cover everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that history. Okay, so just a general history first of all. Age, really important. I mean, if they're, if they're 16, then you're going to obviously think that there's a primary cause and they've never had a, you know established period before. Mm -hmm. If they're 35, then it's going to point you more like more to um, a secondary cause. Yeah. Unless, you know, they're primary and it'd be very unusual for them not, not to have presented before. Also the age of their monarchy, so when do they actually have a period? If they started their periods very early and the woman is say 45, it may be, she may just be going through the menopause because she established her monarchy very early. Mm -hmm. Additionally, have they ever achieved normal menstruation or has this always been irregular? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and that can help with um, syndromes like PCOS, so polycystic ovarian syndrome, where often they get, um, you know, derangements in their normal period. Additionally, the duration of symptoms. Now, we've defined it as greater than six months, okay? So if they haven't had a period for, say, two months, you'd not be as worried. No. Um, additionally, are they sexually active? Obviously, this is important to establish whether they're pregnant or not. If they're not sexually active and they, you know, they tell you they're not, then you can rule out pregnancy, but you should always do a pregnancy test even when they tell you they are not sexually active. Indeed. Um, additionally, contraceptive history is important. If they're on things like the progesterone-only uh, pill or Implanon, um, which is, you know, progesterone implant, then they usually don't get periods with that and they just may not, have, may not understand why they don't. Yeah, I mean, part of the problem with those contraceptives is that um, there's various patterns. Some women get periods, some women don't get periods, some yeah. women get spotting all the time, some women don't. Um, and I mean, that's why it's often very important to explain to these women why. Yeah. But that's a topic for another podcast. Yes. Okay, now I'm going to do the history by type. Now, this might seem odd because you wouldn't know that they were a hypogonadotrophic, hypogonadism patient. But this is just what you need to think about in categories, okay? Because you're skiing. Yeah. So, as we discussed before, this is when um, GnRH isn't released from the hypothalamus or, in fact, too much GnRH is released and you don't get the pulsatile fashion of GnRH, which we discussed in the previous podcast on the menstrual cycle. And you don't get the release of FSH and LH and then you don't get action on the ovary. So, caused by a number of factors, you need to ask about exercise, eating habits and stress factors, okay? Now, often people with eating disorders don't establish menses if they're very young or they get amenorrhea, okay? And that's because of the action on the hypothalamus. Additionally, medical causes of weight loss. So if they've got inflammatory bowel disease and they're losing a lot of weight because they're having a lot of diarrhea, um, can also cause this. 
hyper or hypothyroid can cause um, this this kind of pattern to happen okay um, additionally if they've got um, kind of a central brain tumor that's you know compressing on the hypothalamus mm. you won't get release of GnRH liver and renal disease can also cause these problems I put anosmia here because it's that's that's the lack of smell, sense of smell, okay? And that's linked with the Kalman syndrome that I talked about earlier. Yep. And these patients wouldn't have established um, secondary sexual characteristics. Additionally, also things like recent delivery. So we're talking about things like Sheehan syndrome. So, um, you know, postpartum um, infarction of the pituitary. Okay, so those are the hypogonadotrophic ones. What about the hypergonadotrophic? Okay, so hypergonadotrophic, things you need to ask about congenital abnormalities at birth, and that's things like Turner syndrome, mm -hmm. okay? And that's where you will get the release of GnRH, you will get the FSH and LH, but you won't have, you'll have ovarian failure. Um, and so you'll get extremely high levels of FSH and LH, but no um, estradiol. So the problem's downstream. Yeah. Yeah. Um, additionally, symptoms of premature ovarian failure. So, are they getting those vasomotor symptoms of menopause? Are they getting hot flushes, things like that? Okay. What about if all the hormone levels are normal? Okay, if all these hormone levels are normal, you need to think outside the box. Okay, so you need to think of other endocrine problems that can cause um, failure of menses. So, Cushing's acromegaly um, they can all cause derangements in your period um, additionally very important in um, in this kind of amenorrhea is uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome okay and that's a syndrome with weight gain her uh, acne and diabetes you don't necessarily have to have all these things mm -hmm. um, but that can cause kind of normal hormone levels in this but actually cause derangements in testosterone um, Additionally, recent trauma to the endometrium, so if they've had a curatage, um, say if they've had retained products of conception or something like that, then um, they can get something called Ashman syndrome. Um, also, androgen secreting tumours, so you might ask about virilisation symptoms, so do they have acne, do they have oily skin, things like that, um, and also cyclical abdominal pain you need to ask about. Okay, what's that indicate? That can be um, just congenital abnormalities um, within the uterus and things like that. Okay. Outflow, uh, tract obstructions. And the last one, hyperprolactinoma. What kind of symptoms and drugs are associated with this? Okay, so again, you need to think they, they may have high prolactin levels causing their um, amenorrhea. Commonly can be pregnancy because pregnancy causes an increase in prolactin. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but other causes that you need to... You need to just ask symptoms, so galacturia, so that's milk coming from the breasts, um, headache, because it could be a tumour uh, within the uh, brain, um, and visual symptoms, which I'll go into later on examination, but also ask a thorough drug history, because actually, as I said before, dopamine stops prolactin, so anything that is stopping pro uh, dopamine is going to cause an increase in prolactin, so antipsychotics, anti-dopaminergics like domperidone and histamine blockers. Okay. So let's go through now the examination by types. We're going to use the same system, talk about the same conditions again, but particularly focus on the findings that you may see on examination. Okay, so just think about signs when you think about hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. Signs of an eating disorder, do they look like they've lost a lot of weight? Um, just in terms of anorexia, they can have that lanugo hair, they can have, um, you know, like as I said, just extreme weight loss. In terms of bulimia, they can have dental caries uh, because of the acid of rotting away their teeth. They can get enlarged parotids. Um, and then also just look for the absence of sexually, secondary sexual characteristics. So do they actually have any axillary hair developing? Do they have any breast formation at all? Um, signs of inflammatory bowel disease, this is just generally, but clubbing, erythema nodosum, and then just signs of liver and renal disease, okay? So do they look well? Do they have jaundice? Do they have dialysis lines? Okay. So hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, as I mentioned before, Turner syndrome, there's that whole syndrome, isn't there? But, you know, things like web neck, short stature, you can just see that by looking at them. Yep. Um, and vasomotor symptoms, diff more difficult to tell, but if you're going to do a, you know, vaginal examination, atrophic vaginitis, uh, very thin, dry skin. Okay. 
and nor Mogan allotrophic? So this is really endocrine, but just looking for some you know signs of hypothyroid or hypothyroid. So hypothyroid, everyone knows, but you know pretibial mixed edema, exophthalmos, Typical tachycardia, yeah. hypothyroid, just bradycardia, dry skin. Cushing syndrome, everyone knows those symptoms. Yeah, steroid overuse, etc. Yes, um, and virilization, so acne, hirsutism. And also, you know, it's important to do a PV examination just to examine for causes of outflow tract obstruction. Okay, and then for hyperprolactinoma, we've already spoken about galacteria, but there's a particular visual sort of pattern of loss they get, isn't there? Yeah, so you want to do a cranial nerve examination, particularly just looking for a bitemporal hemianopia. And that's due to the pressure of the tumour on the optic chiasm? Yes. Okay. Okay, so we've talked now about the history and examination. Remember that the history is absolutely crucial and gives you the answer most of the time. Um, but there are some very, very important investigations that should be done in all of these women presenting with um, amenorrhea. Yeah, so first of all, in any woman, any premenopausal woman that comes into you um, complaining about amenorrhea, you want to do a beta HCG test, yeah. really. Um, and that's just a simple pre urine test, um, checking for pregnancy. Not always accurate if there's a recent conception, but um, you must always do this. Always do that, yeah. Okay, then we're going to go into gonadotrophins and estradiol levels. Okay, so just think about that, that chart that I showed you before, that diagram. So if there's low FSH and low estradiol, okay, there is hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, okay? Mm -hmm. If there's a high FSH and a low estradiol, that will be hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism. Okay. Okay, and if both of these are normal, it's normogonadotrophic. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. And then the prolactin. So prolactin, I mean, I've said less than 1,000 can be pregnancy-induced, I mean, pregnancy can cause quite high levels as well, but typically, if it's less than 1,000, it's either drug-induced, hypothyroidism, remember TSH increases uh, prolactin levels, okay? So in hypothyroidism, you get an increase in TSH and you get an increase in prolactin levels. Yeah. Okay, greater than 1,000, you're thinking more about prolactin-secreting tumours, so a microadenoma or a macroadenoma. Yeah, and the key investigation for that is an MRI, yes. as shown here, and this is the kind of thing that you might you might see. Okay, now we, let's talk about androgen status, okay, because this is important in patients with PCOS. Um, you don't actually have to know these. Free androgen in index is basically total testosterone times 100 over sex hormone binding globulin. Seems very complicated. But actually, what you're looking at is in patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome, they get an increase in testosterone. That's why they get this acne hirsutism. Um, and if you just do the free testosterone levels and they're greater than a certain level, you're thinking about androgen tumours, okay? So um, tumours within you know adrenals and things like that. Um, PCOS, one of the key tests is also an ultrasound. And you can see more than 12 follicles per ovary. I mean... I'm sure imaging people understand this better. Um, and also you want to think about doing a, a glucose test in these individuals because they're at more risk of diabetes. Of diabetes. So what is the role of the free androgen index then? Um, is it particular, particularly raised in certain conditions? or is it? Yeah, it'll be more raised in patients with PCOS. Okay, okay. okay. And then other endocrine tests, these are quite obvious really. Yeah, so just dexamethasone suppression test in Cushing's, TSH and T4 in thyroid. And really here, you've, then you've covered most of the endocrine abnormalities. Okay. What about any other investigations? Are there any other important things? So not, again, an ultrasound looking for causes of outflow of tract obstruction, because you might have missed, you know, there might be fibroids or polyps or something like that. Um, and also um, a progesterone challenge test. Now, you do not need to know this, but just remember that it's very useful in checking if there is a withdrawal bleed, okay? And it can go along with um, the FSH and LH levels. Now, if there is um, if there is no withdrawal bleed, then you need to think, is there outflow tract obstruction or is there low estrogen levels? Right. Okay. okay. So just very briefly, can you outline some of the treatments for just some of the conditions that we've we've spoken about? If you suspect a patient has PCOS, then anti-androgen treatments are very useful. Um, and often um, 
you can use pills like the D- Dianet, mm-hmm. which has mm-hmm. anti-androgen in it. Um, also, metformin is useful not just for the diabetes, but actually for increasing fertility. Yep. Um, again, weight reduction can improve the symptoms of PCOS massively. Um, now, with things like prolactinoma, you want to basically use um, dopamine agonists, um, so cabergoline, bromocryptine, um, and if it's very large, so macroadenoma, you may think about transphenoid resection. Remember, in patients with premature ovarian failure who are young, you need to think about replacement of the estrogen because these patients will be increased risk of osteoporosis. Um, but it's not lifelong, is it? You would stop it. Of course you would have to stop it because no patient will be on HRT forever. Yeah. But because they're so young, they will be at that increased risk of osteoporosis. And then also hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. Think about, you know, if they've got an eating disorder, they'll need to get management of that. Weight gain, stress management. Okay. So we've talked about lots and lots of things in this podcast. Could you just give us a sort of brief summary, something for people to take away? Okay, so just remember your kind of main causes, so primary or secondary, Mm -hmm. okay? Remember that hormones are the key to all of this, and it probably will be a hormonal disorder. If it's not, then you need to think about um, outflow tract obstructions. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much for listening to this podcast. Thank you, Kenga, again for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and um, we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.